Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? So this is calculus, right? Okay, good. Uh, I just have to make sure I'm in the right spot too. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm the instructor, uh, Dr. Brady McCary. Uh, so the way the, just logistically, the way the lecture will go is uh, I'll do it uh, on the screen there and uh, I'll write on these uh, sheets of paper and uh, tomorrow probably uh, I'll scan these and post them uh, to the internet so you'll be able to download them. Uh, furthermore, uh, I'm recording this lecture uh, on video uh, and that'll be posted to YouTube. So th those are nice uh, things, right? But uh, don't take that as license not to uh, pay attention. Uh, the reason being uh, is that uh, psychological studies uniformly show that the more engaged you are in the task at hand, the more likely you are to retain uh, the, the material. So it's like literally uh, antithetical to your interest to be goofing off and doing other things. Like you might as well not be here. Uh, so, good, but I would like all of you to be here, of course. Um, let's see, uh, what else? So, I'll write down my contact information. So, my name is Brady McCary. Uh, my email is bcm052 at uh, utdallas.edu. Uh, so, uh, we all have UTD email addresses, right? So that one's mine, and you've got one. And uh, email is a terrific way to contact each other, but uh, I just need to make sure that you understand uh, that, uh, you know, I'm, an, uh, I'm a university employee, which means I sign an employment contract. And uh, y'all are students, which means y'all sign contracts too. And uh, the same clause is in both of our contracts that uh, we agree that uh, all university business must be conducted using university email addresses. So uh, I get it. Uh, everybody and, uh, and their pets has a, a Gmail address or a Yahoo address or whatever, of course. But uh, if you send me an email from there, uh, I literally will never see it. Okay, so then uh, it's not that, uh, it's not that I, don't like Gmail, it's that uh, it's not permissible by, by university policy. Okay, good. Uh, come on in. Uh, so, good, my office. Is FA 2.402. So as it happens, uh, there's three buildings on campus they have the word founders in their name and uh, mine happens to be in Founders Annex. So there's Founders, Founders Annex, and Founders North. And uh, <laughs> Founders Annex is like a little bitty building and uh, I think most people don't even uh, know that it, it exists. <laughs> so that's kind of nice uh, for me. Uh, but uh, part of the problem is, is, well, in the first place, it's kind of hard to find. And in the second place, uh, there's a building right next to it called Founders. Uh, and there's an office 2.402. Uh, and there's some math faculty in there. <laughs> and I'm not them. <laughs> right. So it's uh, like as confusing as could possibly be. Uh, but uh, anyhow, that's, the, that's how it is. Any questions about my contact information? Okay. Uh, good. So uh, when I write uh, REM like that, that means I'm making a remark. So that's, that's the, the meaning of that little symbol. So now I'm going to make, so this is my 
uh, contact information. Uh, so now uh, a remark about the textbook. We'll be using the same textbook uh, that you used for uh, Calculus 1. Uh, mine looks like this because it's the instructor's uh, edition, so it looks kind of slightly different than y'all's. I think y'all's looks like this little inset picture right here, if you happen to have one. Uh, okay, so I'll just write down uh, that information. So this is calculus. with applications eleventh edition the author's name is Leal uh, the publisher is Pearson Uh, I'm, I don't have any strong opinion as to whether or not you get a text. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, as, for, as for homeworks, uh, we're going to do two varieties of homework. One of them is going to be my math lab, which is the same thing that y'all did. Uh, well, uh, for, <laughs> you know, not everyone likes it. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm with you. Uh, my math lab. Uh, that's what we're we're going to use that. Um, and besides that, uh, online homework. We're also going to have written homework. Uh, but that's something uh, that I make and you download and print. So uh, you know, uh, the upshot of that is that I'm not going to like assign, you know, question number 37 from whatever in the textbook. I'm not going to do it that way. But I will make uh, my math lab assignments and uh, and some some things you need to download and print. Good. Any question about the textbook? Yeah. Uh, you said that Leal, L -I -A -L? L yeah, L I A L. Uh, well, there's other authors too. I guess I'll write them. But uh, I don't I don't see how you could possibly uh, be mistaken. Uh, Green. Well. and uh, Richie. Okay, so uh, we're also going to use various tools and things like that uh, this semester. So, uh, <clears throat> like I said, uh, we're going to use YouTube. Uh, specifically, I'm, I uh, I teach two sections of this class, uh, and I'm recording this one on w with my camera here. I have my camera rubber banded to the thingy. Uh, so then I'll, uh, I'll post that to YouTube. So, uh, you know, that, that's nice. Uh, I'll, in a different place, I'll also post PDFs of these pages here. So like I said, uh, don't, don't take that as license not to pay attention. I think that would be uh, extremely unwise. Rather, uh, I'd like for you to sort of take it as uh, insurance that uh, if you miss something, you shouldn't panic, you know, because I'm going to post it. It's not a big deal. Uh, furthermore, you know, if something's not clear, uh, it would be good for you to, you know, you can go back and look. Okay, good. Uh, we're going to use Blackboard, which is the name of the software. Uh, that runs e-learning. Y'all, y'all all use that learning. You know where you log in and you see your grade and stuff like that. It's that thing. Uh, UTD also has uh, something called uh, box.com. Well, really, what we have is we have a corporate account with Box.com. That's what that's what we really have. Uh, so you know Dropbox. You heard of that thing? It's just like that, but not that. But it's the same thing. Uh, 
so what, what specifically that's going to be is that uh, when, uh, when I make written homeworks, the things that you need to download and print, uh, each one of them will have special markings on them that are specific to you. So like, uh, you know, each one of you will log on to this thing and I'll send instructions, it's not complicated. Uh, you'll log on, get the, get, the, get the homework assignment, and it's got a barcode on it, and that barcode is keyed to you. So now, the, all the exercises are the same. It's not like I'm giving you some exercise and you some other exercise. It's not that way. Uh, rather, what it, what it does is it makes it far easier for the grader to get the grades into the gradebook. Okay, so then, in particular, uh, you can't, like, uh, ask your buddy to give you a copy of theirs, right? Because then that's like, uh, that'd be just like someone turning in two different copies of the same assignment because it's got your barcode on it. Okay? Uh, good. So box.com, uh, and of course we'll use uh, email. So box is where like uh, the syllabus and uh, the course notes and your homework assignments will be. So after the homework assignments are graded uh, by the graders, the, the written ones, not the online homeworks, because the online homework is done by, you know, my math lab. So you'll, uh, after the written homework is graded, it'll be scanned and posted. And uh, I won't ever return physical copies to you, but you can download uh, a PDF of, of your homework's there. And it'll be with that box thing. Any questions so far? So there's not a syllabus yet, but I'm going over the, the main things. The reason, <laughs> the reason why there's not a syllabus is because the whole uh, school of natural sciences and math, uh, we had like this uh, network intrusion thing, and there's like an investigation going on. And uh, we can't use our computers, it's sad. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I've, just, I've just recently gotten access to my computer again. So I'll get you a syllabus is you know, pretty, pretty quick, probably tomorrow. Uh, but we'll continue going over all of, the, all of the important things here. Any questions so far? Okay, so then... Uh, the schedule of the course. Currently, we are in lecture zero zero. Because all good mathematicians start counting at zero. And this is a Tuesday. Uh, next lecture, lecture 01, will be on a Thursday. Uh, then, next week on Tuesday, we'll have the next even lecture, lecture 02. Uh, then, on Thursday, we'll have this second odd lecture. Lecture uh, 03. Right, because zero is even. Why, now, why zero even? Okay. So, uh, I don't make a dispute, really, but, uh, but why, does, why does that make zero even? I bring this up because, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, your teachers, uh, and even your math teachers are people too, right? <laughs> so, I, so I have friends and they send me stuff on the internet, you know, that says like, oh, mathematicians don't even know if zero is even. And they just do that to aggravate me, you know? <laughs> if, you've never seen, if you've never seen one, then just don't, don't tell anyone you're taking a math class uh, at any rate. No, zero is even because uh, to be even means that you can take uh, the pile of items in question and break them into groups of size two. And if there's none left over when you do that, then the number of items is even. So 22 is even because you can make 11 groups of size two and there's nothing left over. 
So if you have zero M&Ms, then you can make zero groups of size two, and when you're finished doing that, how many are left over? Zero. So zero is even. Okay, so then uh, corresponding to lecture zero, we'll have uh, an online homework, a, a My Math Lab homework. We'll refer to those as OHWs for online homework. So uh, there will be an online homework, zero, zero. I'll probably post it tomorrow because I need to, you know, do a little bit of configuration things. Uh, it's going to be due right here, due one minute, one minute before Tuesday. Uh, that is to say, 11.59 p.m. And then when I say that, someone usually either says or at least thinks, well, why not midnight? Uh, the answer is because that uh, midnight of Tuesday means different things to different people. To some people, midnight means that uh, you stay up all day Tuesday and then you reach midnight Tuesday. For other people, midnight means the very first instant of Tuesday. But uh, 11.59 p.m. on Monday, everybody agrees upon. Okay, so uh, similarly, after cor corresponding to lecture 01, there will be online homework 01, and it will be due uh, one minute before Thursday. So the, the summary of the online homework is that, uh, well, we're going to have one online homework per lecture, and it's going to be due 11.59 p.m., uh, so like today's, today's Tuesday. So the, so the first one's going to be due six days from now at 11.59 p.m., uh, so on and so forth until the end. Any question about on online homework? Okay. Good. So now, uh, the written homework, the thing that you're going to download from box.com. Uh, what that will be is that uh, each exercise, individual exercise, will be one page. Uh, and uh, what you'll do is uh, you'll print off each page individually. And if there's like four written exercises due, uh, then there'll be four stacks. And, you'll, and they'll be labeled very clearly, and you'll say, oh, this one in that stack, that one in that stack, that one in that stack, that one in that stack. Okay. Uh, they are going to be called WEXs for written exercise. And uh, the name, you know, uh, like corresponding to lecture zero, there might be something like, uh, you know, WEX. And then the first two numbers will be zero, zero to, to signify that it corresponds to lecture zero. And then the next number will just be uh, an index to make it unique. So WEX 000. WEX 001. WEX 002. And WEX. Zero, zero, 003, maybe. I'm not saying that it's going to be exactly four items each time. You know, maybe three, um, maybe more. But uh, it's always, I promise, going to be reasonable because, after all, I've got to, <laughs> everything that I ask you to do, somehow I have to deal with it, right? So, <laughs> so I'm limited by, by me, right? Okay, so these, these ones are going to be due at the beginning of that lecture. <clears throat> So these are due <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, so, so far there's two varieties of homework. And I want to stress that, uh, you know, I wrote four things here, but that doesn't mean four homework assignments. That means four exercises. It means four sheets of paper. Okay? So it's not like, it's not four, it's not uh, four uh, homework sets. It's four exercises. So please don't panic. Uh, so do at the beginning of that lecture. Okay. So two, uh, two kinds of homework. Then, now, at lecture two, We'll have more WEXs, except uh, these, uh, I will, you know, I'll watch you do them, you know. In principle, like these ones, you could like, uh, you know, pay someone to do them or something, right? I can't police that. You know, please do it yourself. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I can't, I can't police what happens outside of here. Uh, then, in, in this lecture, we will have a further WEX, you know, some, some number of exercises. So WEX 004, WEX 005, say, and so these are a quiz. You know, they're, they're really just three exercises, but you can kind of imagine them to be basically functionally a quiz. So, these ones that we take during lecture and I watch you do, okay, so then uh, if you have done the, uh, these exercises, then you should be completely prepared for these ones. And there should, there should be no surprises, right, is what I mean to say. So supposing that uh, you've done the online homework and you've done the, the WEX homework, when you, when you come here for the WEX quiz part, no surprises. Uh, good. So now, that's uh, seven or so written exercises per lecture. Okay. Now... Uh, of those seven, <clears throat> of the approximately uh, seven WEX zero zero, you know, I'll just write a star. The star represents you know, that whole set. Uh, of the approximately uh, seven of those, uh, only a subset <clears throat> will be graded out of 10. All questions, will, all waxes will be graded out of 10. Uh, the rest, will be checked for completion. So I'm not going to announce in advance which are which. Yes? So it's going to be the same for everybody, I'm just going to take the best of for each student? No, <laughs> we're not going to do best of. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you might ask, why this? Why do it this way? Uh, okay, there's a couple reasons. So in the first place, uh, if, if, uh, if I could be a dictator, right, <laughs> then uh, I'd grade all of them. But uh, the, act the actual fact of the matter is that uh, I'm assigned a certain amount of help, labor, and uh, I'm, I can't exceed it. Right? We have certain heuristics about how much uh, I can assign to the graders to work, and uh, well, that's how much I'm going to assign. Uh, also, I uh, really need you to participate. Uh, as a result, pretty much uh, there's always going to be at least one of these, but you don't know which is going to be graded out of 10. So, uh, you know, that, that's usually enough to enforce your participation in the homework uh, because you don't know which one's going to be which. 
Uh, good. Any questions about uh, so far? Okay. So uh, by, by checked for completion, uh, that means more or less something like the following. Uh, that uh, in the first place, did you turn it in? Right? If you didn't turn it in, then uh, it's not complete. Uh, also, uh, does, it, does it appear that uh, you made a, a legitimate attempt? You know, that, that, that the grader can look at and say, yeah, it looks like a legitimate attempt was made, you know, like in like three seconds, just yeah, or no, right? So if it's blank, you know, you didn't try it. Or if you turned it in and there's a, there's a beautiful picture of like daisies on it or something, well, that's excellent, but uh, it, you know, if the grader doesn't think that constitutes a try, then it doesn't count, <laughs> okay? So uh, the completion ones are out of one. Okay, so it's a yes or no, zero or one. Good. Any questions so far? Yeah. Sorry to take it back to the textbook thing. Not a problem. But, uh, so I just went off to the uh, my math lab mm -hmm. and asked him for a course ID. I'll send you the information. Okay. It's not set up yet. Other questions? I think, if I remember correctly, that uh, you'll be able to just like click on something through Blackboard. Oh, okay, okay. I think. Uh, but uh, I'll send I'll send a message at any rate. Other questions? Okay. <clears throat> so uh, you know this is the this is going to be the the pace of it. So we're going to have lectures, and then more or less you can think of it like uh, you know one week from the lecture, uh, you're going to you know demonstrate your your skills at that time. So you're going to do the online homework you know, over the course of that week. You're going to download and do the written homework over the course of that week. You're going to turn it in. Then you're going to have a quiz-ish thingy, you know, three or four exercises, and you're going to turn those in. And then I'm going to select a subset of those uh, for grading, and uh, you know, it'll get graded and scanned and posted back to you. So uh, as for the quizzes, uh, I'm either going to give them at the beginning, or at the middle, or at the end of the lecture, and I'm not going to say when. Uh, the reason why I'm going to do that and not say when, again, is just to uh, encourage your attendance and participation, right? If you're not here, then you can't take it. Okay? Uh, the reason why, there's two, there's, there's two reasons why I'm really on, on that uh, art attendance and participation. One is that, uh, is that uh, well, in the end it's political. But not my, not my, not my uh, politics. Uh, rather, the state of Texas, right? The state of Texas uh, really, really uh, is bearing down on all the universities to uh, to demonstrate that uh, all students on who are receiving financial aid uh, are actually here, right? Uh, because uh, they passed uh, they passed uh, legislation which more or less says that uh, if the school can demonstrate that they weren't here then the state of Texas is not going to permit in-state tuition for that student, for that class. So you're going to have to pay a bunch of money. And uh, well, in the end, uh, you know, the legislature breathes down on the UT system, who breathes down on UTD, who breathes down on one of my bosses, and you know, boss, 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 down to me, right? That's how it, that's how it works. Uh, so there's that. Uh, also, uh, if you ever come to my office, uh, you can look at the statistics that I post out on my window, which show that uh, there's like, a, like an 85% correlation between attendance and participation and your grade. <laughs> and uh, that's ridiculous, meaning that uh, more or less, that uh, if, you, if you attend and participate in all items, you can strongly expect to pass. And you can strongly expect not to pass if you don't. And it's not because, uh, it's not because like I uh, make such students fail. It's just that's the way the numbers fall. That's just where they are. Okay, good. Uh, now, uh, the semester is gonna be broken more or less into two halves. Uh, we're going to do this uh, for you know, about half the semester and then we're gonna have a, a midterm exam. Okay. So, uh, you know, you could, you could think of it like this. Here, this is, uh, you know, 
lectures. This is the beginning. Uh, T0, and this is TF, right? And then uh, halfway through the semester, we're going to have a midterm exam. And, uh, you know, at the end of the semester, we're going to have a final exam. So, uh, before the midterm exam, we will have turned in a whole bunch of WEXs. And uh, a subset of those will have been graded out of 10. So, let's say, you know, here's all the WEXs that are graded out of 10. You know, like that one, and that one, and that one, and that one. You know, who knows which ones. You know, these are out of 10 WEXs. There'll be more than the eight or whatever that I drew there. There'll be more. Uh, then, you know, there's other WEXs that uh, were just completion. You get the idea. So when the exam comes, the midterm exam, it will consist of two pieces. So the midterm exam will have uh, new questions. Uh, and they're comprehensive. Uh, over the first half. <clears throat> that is to say, over all this material that we were able to cover up to that time. Uh, so that's one part. You know, it's going to be, I don't know how many, I'll have to like uh, just see how it looks when I get there. But you know, probably like uh, five or six questions. Furthermore, by the time uh, we get to the midterm, there will be, you know, many of uh, WEXs that are graded out of 10. Some of them you will have done great, and some of them less than great. For, any, for, you know, for who knows what. You know, maybe you didn't understand it. Maybe you weren't here. I don't know. Uh, but uh, it's likely that uh, at least some of them you didn't do so excellent on. So maybe it's the case uh, for you that uh, you did not do great on WEX 063, which would mean uh, a WEX corresponding to lecture six, uh, question three in the series. Maybe you didn't do so excellent on that one, and that one was graded out of 10. Maybe you made like two out of 10. The, the midterm will have a counterpart to that question, and you can, at your option, uh, attempt that exercise. And if you make that, if you attempt it, then whatever you make on that exercise will replace uh, your first attempt. Uh, but it's a double-edged sword because uh, it's going to replace it. So, like, uh, if you make a, if you made a two out of ten, uh, the first go round, and then you make a ten out of ten on the midterm, great. Now you have a ten out of ten. You did it. Uh, but uh, you know, if you make it, made a two out of ten the first go round, and then make a one out of ten. And now you have a 1 out of 10. <laughs> it's less awesome. Uh, so <clears throat> that section of the exercises will be called the, the redo section. And uh, I'll have to see where the, you know, I'll have to see how many out of 10 WEXs are up for grabs, and I'll have to see how the graders are doing and all of that, but you can expect probably on the order of like, uh, you know, there'll be like 30 out of 10 WEXs or something like that, 
you know, I don't know how many. Uh, then, uh, and I, I, I'd allow you to redo up to 10, meaning that uh, you could select none. You could say, I don't want to, I don't want to take part at all. That'd be fine. Uh, you could do just three of them, or you could do up to 10. So uh, many students find uh, that uh, they're able to significantly improve uh, their, their WEX grade uh, at that point. So uh, now the reason why I, I do things that way, now there's a couple reasons. So the first reason is that uh, from a teaching point of view, I'm not really concerned, you know, I'm a little concerned. Uh, if you didn't understand the week six material at the time that I first tested it. I really would have liked, uh, liked it if you did. But, uh, okay, maybe you didn't. At any rate, all that I need is for you to understand the week six material by the time you leave, right? That's all that I really need. It doesn't matter, you know, no one down the line cares if in June, you know, you knew it. If in August, you do know it, right? who cares? Uh, so that, that's one reason. The other reason is that, uh, you know, that's part of the benefit of uh, using this kind of complicated system of, uh, you know, you've got to download the homeworks that have your name on it, you know, and your barcode. That way I can keep track of all the little bits, you know. Uh, it's just part of the, the benefits of using that kind of system. Any question about that? The final exam will be just like that except, you know, obviously comprehensive over the second half, and you'll have the opportunity to redo WEXs from the second half. Any question about any of that? How much percentage did you say? The, the WEXs? No, of the, the midterm. How much percentage of your grade is it? Ah, well, okay. So, uh, well, there's uh, three parts to your grade. WEX is 70%. Uh, yeah. So That's what? All your right. So so you know you could imagine like it it could come to pass that uh, you know maybe there's say 50 wexes that are graded out of 10. That means that th that's 500 points up for grabs right there, uh, and then perhaps and a further 100 are completion. That's a that's 100 completion points. So that that's 600 points. That, uh, that uh, pool constitutes 70, you know, I'm not saying that that's the way it's going to be, uh, but that pool constitutes 70% of your grade. Uh, the rest of it uh, is uh, your, uh, uh, your My Math Lab thingy and uh, your attendance and participation. So WEX is like, uh, you know, if you're just like trying to see what should I focus on, it's the WEX. So, uh, you know, what I mean to say is like, uh, you know, uh, the, the midterm exam is going to have like five exercises on it. They're, those are going to be graded out of 10. So that's 50 points. You know, but uh, there's a further opportunity to redo 10. So that's, uh, you know, is it going to be worth, you know, if you do all 10, then the midterm is worth 150 points for you, right? But uh, if you don't do, redo anything, it's worth 50 points for you. Yeah. Then don't do, then don't do it. Yeah. Right. You just don't do them. There are, yeah, you already got them. There, there's no. Uh, this, that's your second stab at them, right? If you already got them the first try, then uh, I don't need to hear more from you <laughs> on that score. <clears throat> Other questions? Okay. So any questions at all before we get to math? Okay, let's do it. All right. Oh, yeah. Well, well okay. One thing. Uh, one thing is that uh, I will uh, mention that, uh, you know, uh, like I said, I'll scan these and post them. And uh, when I... When I uh, when I write in prose, like if I'm saying something, like that's, all, that's been all of this, uh, when I write in prose, uh, I write it in block print. Uh, only because that's, uh, you know, I used to write like in uh, cursive and other ways,
But uh, in the end, block print, even though it's kind of slow and it kind of looks like I'm screaming at you a little bit, you know, because that's what it means on the internet. Uh, this is the most legible thing I can do. Uh, but when, I, uh, when I'm writing math, I write it in uh, kind of like a cursive looking uh, script. So you can tell, uh, I'll, I'll point it out when we start writing some math. When I'm writing uh, prose, it's in block print. And when I'm writing math, it's in a script. OK. So uh, just a brief remark about calculus. Now, calculus is a, is a, a big and important topic. Um, you know, uh, the truth is is that uh, many, if not all of you, uh, are unlikely to use calculus in your day-to-day -day <laughs> professional lives <laughs> when you move on. You could. I mean, I think it would be great. But uh, it's unlikely. Uh, but that, that sort of raises the question of <laughs> why, are we, why are we doing this? <laughs> why? Uh, well, the reason is, be there's two, two reasons, two main reasons. Uh, one reason is that uh, calculus uh, is an extremely powerful tool, right? Uh, fortunes are won and lost every moment of the day, li literally, using calculus, right? Just, just since I, we just started writing on this page, millions, probably, probably hundreds of millions of dollars have changed hands be because of programs that people wrote uh, that are more or less optimizing things from the point of view of calculus. You know, de you know rapid trading. Uh, good, so it's useful in that sense, like it's an extremely useful tool. Uh, in, in another sense, uh, it, uh, you know, this, the same kind of thing that can be said, uh, you know, I'm a math major, why did I have to take uh, history? <laughs> you know, uh, well, because uh, it enriches it enriches our lives and helps us think clearly about uh, modern events, uh, ha being a little bit familiar with what happened uh, in the past. Same kind of thing here. So with that being said, I hope that uh, you, we can enjoy this as much as possible, even though I recognize that uh, to a person, I think we're all here because someone told us to be. <laughs> all right. So uh, there's two points of view in calculus. Uh, one of them is the differential point of view. Uh, this is primarily uh, the topic in Calculus 1. Uh, then the other point of view is the integral point of view. This is primarily uh, the topic of calculus two. So the differential point of view is, uh, can be summarized kind of as follows. And that is, uh, I hope all of you have had the experience of being out on the ocean, uh, and uh, specifically with calm seas. So uh, if you've ever been out on the ocean with calm seas, uh, I, hope you've, I hope you've had that opportunity. But if not, you know, imagine like Pirates of the Caribbean in your mind's eye or something. I don't know. Uh, when you look out, uh, if you're not like way up high on the mast of the boat, rather, if you're pretty close to the surface, uh, the water looks flat, doesn't it? Or, like, uh, you could just travel a few hundred miles north of here to the plains, and, uh, like in Kansas, and uh, you, 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 know, you could be astonished at just how flat the world can look. Uh, you, know, they, you know, I don't know if it's really true, to what extent, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, they say that the ancients used to believe that the, that the earth was flat. 
you know, they turned out not to be correct. You know, flat like, uh, like you could walk off, you know, the edge is what I mean. Uh, it turns out we live on a globe, okay? Uh, but, uh, you know, mathematically what I'm saying is that uh, you can kind of forgive the ancients because uh, it's pretty flat. <laughs> it's pretty flat uh, because the, the surface of the Earth is smooth-ish, you know, and we're very small compared to the Earth. We're very small compared to the Earth. Uh, you know, this building is big compared to us, but even, even still, this building is small compared to the Earth. Uh, what I mean is that uh, you can forgive the ancients for thinking that uh, the Earth was flat in the same sense that you can forgive the architect and engineers of this building for assuming that they were working on a flat surface, right? If you were to look at the blueprints for this building, I don't think that you would see any calculations owing to the curvature of the Earth. <laughs> okay, because the Earth's flat-ish. That's, uh, that's calculus from the differential point of view, is that uh, if you're dealing with a, with a regular object, an object that's smooth for some notion of smooth, uh, if, you're, if you're on it and you're small enough in comparison to that object, then locally it looks flat. That's, that's, that's the entire calculus, right? You don't even need to take calculus. You shouldn't even have taken it. You should just let me tell, tell you that, right? No, it, it, calculus was helpful. Okay, so then uh, the differential point of view is that uh, locally, smooth objects look flat. Okay, we'll, we'll elaborate on that in a little bit. But uh, I want you to have it in your mind that uh, that's what the differential point of view is. Uh, the integral point of view uh, is something like the following. So the integral point of view is that, uh, you know, you could say, okay, um, here's a shape. We're going to call it a rectangle. You know, like, uh, like I've, I've taken away all the notions of shape that you, that you previously had. They're gone, right? Out the window. So here's this thing, a figure. Uh, let's come up with a name for it. Oh, someone thinks rectangle's good? Yeah, I like that. We'll go with rectangle. Then we can get out a ruler, which is to say a linear measuring device, not, a, not an autocrat. Right? Uh, and we could, we could measure it. Uh, suppose that we measure this to have length A, uh, and this one has length b, then uh, we, can, we can come up with a new measure for the size of this rectangle. And uh, what, I, what, what we want it to be is how much paint it would take to paint it. Okay. Uh, let's call that, how about area? Area is, is great. Uh, so then the, this has area. We'll define it to be product AB. Okay, so now that means that uh, now we've got a we didn't have any shapes before, so now we've got a shape. Its name is rectangle, and furthermore, we have a notion for how big it is, and that notion we're calling area. And the way that you calculate area is by measuring uh, two consecutive sides uh, with a linear measurement device, and then computing the product. Now, here's another shape. You know, uh, you know we, we know other shapes now, so we'll re-import all the things, right? So that's like a circle. And uh, you know the area of a circle, right? You know the formula, pi r squared. But have you ever considered, uh, why, should it, uh, why should it be that? Why pi r squared? You know, why not something else? Or, you know, you can consider the, uh, a triangle. And, uh, you know, that's a shape. It's got an area. Uh, what's, it, what's the formula for its area? Well, you know, you, you, there's, a, there's a formula. Uh, but, uh, you know, here's a shape, you know, that's uh, not common enough in human experience to have a name, right? It's not a circle. It's not a, it's not a rectangle. It's not a what, you know, it's not, it's not, it doesn't have a named shape. Nevertheless, I think we can agree that, uh, you know, if I was to get out some nail polish and we were to paint it, we could come to an agreement about how much, how much paint it takes to paint it, right? 
less than all of this, right? <laughs> well, you paint it, but it, so it's a shape, uh, and it has an area, but it doesn't have a name. So uh, nevertheless, we want a formula for its area. So here's the thing. Here's the thing, is that uh, if you zoom in really, really, really close, really close to it, uh, so you, you know, like right here, I'm gonna I'm gonna consider this little piece that looks like a line. You know, but only because you're so far away from it. Let's uh, let's zoom in on it. Here's my calculus eyeball. Here we're looking. That's a that's an eyeball. You know, we're looking really close at it. Uh, and it turns out, oh, that's actually just a really skinny rectangle. So, uh, you know, here's the calculus from the integral point of view, is that uh, every shape that's smooth in some way, and I'm being vague with what smooth means, uh, every shape that's uh, sort of like a, a nice looking shape like that one, can be broken into infinitely many, infinitely small rectangles. And you can find the area of every one of those rectangles. And then the formula for the shape is the summation of the areas of all those rectangles. So the integral point of view in calculus is just that uh, you pick your favorite thing, like rectangles, and you say, oh, look, that's something that's not a rectangle. But uh, I can break it up into infinitely many infinitesimal rectangles. Or, you know, maybe your favorite thing is a parallelogram. You can say, oh, look, I found something that's not a parallelogram. Uh, but I can break it into infinitely many infinitesimal parallelograms. And then I can say things about it. You know, that sounds kind of wild, but uh, here's something. Uh, are you aware that uh, every one of us is a mammal? And uh, that uh, each one of us consists literally of trillions upon trillions of cells. And if we were to look closely at any one of us, uh, in fact, we're subdivided into these little bitty pieces. So that uh, each one of us is the summation of these trillions and trillions of little bitty pieces. That's all that calculus is. We're just looking at something being broken into little bitty pieces. So the differential point of view is that locally things are flat. The integral point of view is that uh, you can break things up into infinitely many infinitesimal pieces. And that's all of calculus right there. So the thing that ties these two together in a nice bow is uh, the main result of this semester. These points of view are tied together by the aptly named the fundamental theorem of calculus. So uh, I understand that uh, the, the y'all have taken the calculus one course and, uh, you know, as it happens, you didn't all stop at the same place <laughs> and cover the same material, which is terrific. So uh, some of you uh, know what I mean when I say antiderivative. Some of you don't. Uh, some of you know what I mean when I say integral. Uh, some of you don't. I would say probably all of you are confused about the distinction between an antiderivative and an integral. And uh, until I just said that sentence, you were pretty sure that they were the same thing. But if that's the case, you're mistaken. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll, we'll work through that. Uh, at any rate, there's these concepts in calculus, derivative, antiderivative, and integral. And they're all different. Uh, and they're all tied together in a nice bow with the fundamental theorem, which tells you more or less that uh, if locally you know how to look at something and construe it as a flat object, then globally, uh, you can take that local point of view, break it into infinitely many infinitesimal objects, and, and then globally realize it as the sum of all those things. It's the most beautiful thing, uh, well, in my view, which is biased, uh, 
uh, it's the most beautiful thing you'll learn in all of your undergraduate uh, classes. But I'm biased, right? <laughs> okay, so calculus from the differential point of view. Here's the idea. Suppose that uh, we're given function f uh, and let's consider the plot of y is f of x. So now when we were talking about the globe, <coughs> uh, we were talking about a a surface, something that uh, you know you could imagine walking around on, but uh, now currently we're not talking about uh, that. Rather, uh, that that kind of thing. Uh, we're talking about uh, something like this, like a curve. <clears throat> so this is the plot of y is f of x. And uh, I'd like for you to imagine, if you can, uh, that you're a, uh, a one-dimensional creature and you live on the red world, which means that, uh, you know, you're here. You're here, and you can only imagine, right? You can't imagine c going off of the red world, okay? In the same sense uh, that, uh, you know, physicists, some, claim that we live in a, you know, uh, eleven dimensional space. Uh, no one's ever witnessed those other seven dimensions, so some folks like me are a little bit skeptical of that, but uh, I'll be swayed by the evidence when it's posted. Uh, the reason why I'm a little bit skeptical of that is that I don't really see how I'm supposed to move in any one of those other seven dimensions. What I'm telling you is that uh, you've got to imagine that uh, you live on this red and it's inconceivable to you, not even, not even sensible, you couldn't even sense how to move off of it. So you can move forward and backwards. That's all that you can do. You know, sort of like with the curve or against it. That's all you can do. Okay, so now we've given it coordinates. So let's say that this uh, corresponds to some value like x is c. So that's uh, the horizontal position of the point in question. And this is the vertical position of the point in question. So now, uh, if this is point x is c, uh, and this red is the plot of y is f of x, then uh, how high is this? f of c, right? Which is just to say that uh, that point right there uh, is the point C comma F of C. So what I'd like for you to imagine is that uh, I could grab hold of this C, which is down here, and I could wiggle it around. Uh, and uh, you would witness this uh, dashed green axis moving around because that point would be moving around. So I grab it right here, wiggle, wiggle. Uh, and all the time, uh, all the time, this point would remain on the red. Okay. Now, uh, here's the thing, is that uh, at that point right there, if you zoom in really close, then, uh, you know, you can do it. Locally, to that point, it's starting to look like a line, isn't it? That's what I'm saying. You know, you get, you get really close, and just looking at the red, that looks like a line. Globally, no. Globally, no, right? Uh, even if you were on a big ship, like a cruise ship, out in the middle of, of the ocean, uh, and they're very calm seas, if you get way up high on the stacks, you can actually see the curvature of the Earth. You can see it. 
But uh, if you're out in the middle of the ocean and it's smooth seas and you're, you know, you're like, you know, maybe somehow you get your head right above the surface of the ocean, it's, it's as flat as can be from that point of view. So what I'm saying is that uh, locally it looks flat, like a line. So the best local flat approximation to that point looks like this. So what I'm saying is at that point, if you're small enough, then uh, the world, the red world, looks like the blue world. They're interchangeable. In the same kind of sense that uh, if you were out in the middle of Kansas and I was, I, I was magical, okay, I could like stop the clock and make an actual flat world you know, that's like maybe just a couple hundred miles in diameter and, and replace the real world with that one, and you wouldn't know. You wouldn't be able to tell. What I'm saying is that uh, if you were here and you were small, I could replace the red world with the blue world, and uh, you wouldn't be able to tell, not according to shape. So this best local flat approximation to something, that's kind of a clumsy phrase to say. Uh, there's a, what's the... It's, but it's important enough of a concept to have its own word. What's the name for this blue line? The tangent line, right? So, uh, not all points uh, on the red world will have a tangent line. That is to say, not all points on the red world look locally flat. So, like, the majority of, play, of points in Kansas, I would say, uh, they look locally flat. Right? Even if it's like a, even if it's like a smooth hill, right? If you were a little bitty creature and it was, you know, you know, a, a slow rolling hill, you might just think, no, the whole world is this way, you know? That's the down way, and that way is the up way. But the whole world is like this, you know, a little bit ant. You never really get off the hill. Uh, but not all points... Uh, can be seen as locally flat. So what's, a, what's an example uh, of a point on this red curve that's just un under n no amount of magnification will ever be locally flat? The pointy place, right? If you were there, if you were there, then uh, right on the point. Okay, you, look, uh, you look to the left, uh, you know, you're falling down that way. You look to the right, you're falling down. Nowhere is it, has it become flat. So there's no tangent here. At that uh, specific point. Now, one thing that uh, is of use in calculus uh, fr from, a point, from the point of view of applications uh, is that uh, very often you want to know where uh, the tangent, where there is a tangent, and moreover, where the tangent is horizontal. So you've got to be a little careful when you're talking to a mathematician, because uh, they use, you know, like any, like any specialized uh, person, we have specialized language, and sometimes we take words that, uh, you know, mean something to the general population, but mean something else to us. So uh, when I say horizontal, I mean, uh, uh, like when you are out on the ocean and you look out at the horizon, like that. But uh, when I say flat, uh, all that that means is flat. So like uh, the wall is flat. The floor is flat. Uh, the wall is not horizontal. The floor is horizontal, right? So what I mean is that, uh, you know, this line is flat. Uh, but uh, one of the things you really want in calculus is you want lines that are uh, horizontal, right? meaning that their slope is zero. Uh, so in this particular example, you know, it's about right there-ish. The notable thing about that in this specific exercise is that uh, notice that that's a local minimum. Right? So one of the most notable things about uh, calculus is uh, if you can find a, a horizontal tangent line, then that may be the location of a local minimum or a local maximum or a variety of other things. Uh, good. So one way we could calculate the slope, uh, back up. 
primarily, the thing that we're interested in concerning tangent lines is their slope. So like uh, this, this particular tangent line has positive slope, and we just talked about tangent lines which have slope zero, which is, which is to say that uh, they're horizontal. Uh, so the process and concept of slope of tangent line is uh, important enough, and the phrase process of computing slope of tangent line is clumsy enough <laughs> that uh, that has its own name. What's the name of that? Finding slope of tangent line. Derivative, right? Uh, so the derivative of f at x equal to c uh, is the slope of the tangent line. at c f of c. So, you know, uh, more or less, we can say it like this. All the calculus that you learned was basically, uh, you know, to, to a large extent, you learned like recipes. Like, oh, when I see this kind of formula, then uh, I do this kind of calculation to compute the derivative. Okay. Uh, but please don't lose the forest for the trees because in the end, what, what that's telling you, uh, the, the main idea, is that... Uh, is that uh, there's such a thing called a tangent line, and what you're interested in is its slope. And uh, you learned a lot of techniques for specific cases to calculate that, uh, that slope. OK. Uh, good. So let's have an example. So when I write uh, uh, ex, instead of being a remark, that's uh, an example. Uh, also, uh, I, I said I would mention it, uh, you know, when I'm writing prose, I write this in block, but uh, f, that's the name of a function, so it's uh, a math function, so it's in this script style. And, uh, you know, that's, an, that's a, also an f, and I'm not, like, losing my mind <laughs> writing f's some way and other f's another way. Rather, it's a stylistic choice that I'm making so that you can see what's what. Okay, so I'll say let, let f of x be equal to 13x squared plus 26x plus 9. Which is funny, right? Because this is math 1326. So, so, so we've got a function that's, that says that. Okay. Uh, good. So let's find the equation of the tangent line. Uh, at x is equal to 3. So find the equation of the tangent line. All right. So now, uh, well, in order to do that, uh, you've got to know how to find the equation of a line at all, right? <laughs> right? So that's, uh, you know, the state of Texas assures me that you know how to do that. But uh, just in case, let's go over that. You know, because the state of Texas has known to be mistaken from time to time. Uh, so this is a remark within an example. Uh, this is called the point uh, slope formula for a line. So uh, if you have a line that uh, passes through point x0, y0, like so, uh, and, if it do and if it does this, uh, it does this with slope. little m, uh, then the equation of that line is y minus y0 is equal to m multiplied by x 
minus x0. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an idea and a formula that's uh, just uh, expected knowledge. Okay, so then anytime you want the equation of a line, a line that isn't vertical, uh, you need two things. You need a point which is on that line uh, and the slope of that line. Uh, and if you have those two things, then you can put that into this formula and usually the request is solve for y and simplify or something like that. Okay, so then uh, back to the request at hand. Uh, the request at hand is that uh, we had a function f. We had a function f uh, and the request was to find the equation of the line at a specific point. Uh, well, at, uh, at a specific input, really, at x is 3. So in order to find the equation of that tangent line, we need two things. We need a point that is on that tangent line, and we need the slope of that tangent line. So let's back up just slightly. So now f of x is a polynomial of degree 2. Uh, because uh, polynomials of degree 2 are so common and important, they have their own kind of name that begins with q. What is it? Starts with Q. Quadratic, right? Quadratics, you know, polynomials of degree 2 are so important that uh, they've got a special name. Uh, good. Then, if you were to plot a quadratic, all quadratics plot uh, to become a specific kind of shape, a shape that is so common and so important that that shape has a name. <laughs> What's the name of the shape of the plot of a quadratic? Parabola, Parabola right? So, uh, if we were to plot f, its plot would be a parabola uh, if you're far enough away. But if you get really, really close, it's going to look flat. That's the whole idea. Uh, well, so suppose that we're far away and we can see that it's a parabola. Will this parabola open up or down? That is to say, would it hold water or would it shed water? Sorry? Uh, I, I, so I agree that uh, some parabolas open down and some up, but uh, what I'm saying is that, uh, is that uh, you should be able to tell me right now what, what the case is. It, it opens up. It opens up in the end uh, because its leading coefficient is positive. That's uh, an item from uh, college algebra. The, the fact that the leading coefficient is 13, which is positive. So uh, the plot, <clears throat> the plot of y equal to f of x uh, from, you know, from some distance is going to look like a parabola that opens up. Okay, now what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, if we could zoom in really far to any point that you would care to zoom, uh, Eventually, when you zoom close enough, it's going to look like a line, no matter what point you care to select. Some of those points, some of those lines are going to be sloping down, like that one. That one's going to be horizontal. That one's going to be sloping up. Uh, what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to uh, zoom in on the point that has x coordinate 3. So suppose that uh, that's this point here. In fact, I'll put it over here just for sake of argument. So that's, uh, I'm, you know, just drawing something, just to give us an idea. So that's the point that we're uh, concerned with. Um, that's its horizontal coordinate. How do we find its vertical coordinate? So its horizontal coordinate is 3. What's its vertical coordinate? Right. So then the, the, uh, that point, its coordinates are 3, f of 3. Right? And uh, you know, I'll worry about evaluating f of 3 in a minute. The only thing that I need you to uh, observe is that uh, you know, we know that the horizontal coordinate is 3 and the vertical coordinate is just what you get when you plug in 3. Uh, then, at that particular point, hmm. I 
lost my blue pin. That's not in my hand. Oh, that's right. So what we want is the equation of this line. We want the equation of that line. So what's the slope of that line? Like, uh, just, like, just like we said that the horizontal coordinate, it, uh, well, it was given as 3, so the vertical coordinate is f of 3. What's the slope? OK. You're nearly there, but you need to say one more thing. The, is the derivative of that function evaluated at 3, right? Because, uh, you know, the derivative of the function is another function, and you've got to know that you have to evaluate it at 3. So uh, this has slope little m equal to the derivative of f evaluated at 3. Y'all use the prime thingy for derivative, right? So I mean that's like the whole story right there. Now it's just a now it's just a boring calculation, if you understand uh, the concept. You want the equation of a line. Anytime you want a line, you need two things: a point and a slope. You were given the horizontal coordinate of the point. The vertical coordinate is obtainable by plugging in the horizontal coordinate. Then you need the slope. So you calculate the derivative and plug in the input. Okay. So as for the point. x0 is 3, y0 is f evaluated at 3, and that looks like calculator work to me. My calculator is reporting 204. Okay, as for the slope, Here's why I have to rely on the fact that you're in Calculus 2, so you must have taken Calculus 1. Please tell me, uh, what is the derivative of uh, f evaluated at x? So what's, remember, it can be done term by term. Very good. 26x uh, plus 26. And then uh, that's because, remember, uh, this one is done using the power rule, rule right? So it's like uh, that 2 comes down and multiplies the 13, blah, blah. Uh, you know, the derivative of x to 1 is just uh, 1. And then the derivative of 9 is what? 0, right? So the, der the reason why the derivative of 9 is 0 is, well, imagine the function whose output is always 9. Right? No, matter what, no matter what input you provide, its output is 9. Uh, and if you were to look at its plot, its plot would be a horizontal line at height 9. Now in your mind's eye, imagine a horizontal line and tell me, what's the slope? Zero, right? That's why the derivative of 9 is zero, because it's a plot, it's horizontal. Okay, uh, fine. So then the slope, little m, is the derivative uh, evaluated at 3. Which I think is kind of funny because, you know, m's and 3's are kind of like the same thing except just turn sideways. So 26 times 3 plus 26, 104. <clears throat> uh, as a result, we know that uh, the equation of the tangent line is y minus uh, 204 equal to 104 multiplied by x minus 3. So on a real exercise, you know, I'd say something like, you know, put it in slope intercept form, you know, which means y is mx plus b, that thingy. So then let's do that real quick. y minus 204 equal 104x and then minus 312. So y 
is 104x. And then uh, add uh, minus 108. OK. Any question about uh, the work? Yeah? The f prime of 3 104, how did you say? Did I make a mistake? Uh, I plugged 3 into here. Oh, OK. Uh, so I computed. No, I, I didn't do the calculation, and I was just curious how you got Okay. Uh, good. <clears throat> so so there it is. Uh, now, uh, this just because I'm going to use it all semester long, uh, and because some of you are shy, I'm sure. Uh, I'll just mention that uh, you know this this symbol right here is pronounced out loud in English as therefore. Uh, it means that uh, because of the follow, because of the previous things that we said, it is the case that blah 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 blah. But uh, that's kind of a mouthful, so mathematicians have a name for that. <laughs> it's called entailment. Uh, but uh, you know, I'll say therefore. Any question about this? Good. So uh, I have a follow-up question. follow up. Uh, you know, I didn't say explicitly, but an exercise might say, you know, like uh, draw a sketch of what this might look like. And uh, I'd expect you to produce something like this. Okay, now, in the sketch, so in your uh, guess sl uh, slash sketch, Uh, let, let me say it like this. <clears throat> uh, does the sine of the slope of the tangent line agree? with the final answer. So what do I mean by that? Let's think about it for a second. So in the final answer, what, what did turn out to be the slope of the tangent line? Positive, right? So 104, and in particular, 104 is positive. OK. What about uh, in our guess? You know, because I drew a guess there. What's, this, what's the sign of the slope of the, my guess? It's negative, right? How can you see that uh, this particular one, this blue one, that we're specifically talking about? Because it's going down, right? So what's the answer to this question? The answer is no, they don't agree. Uh, that's, that's not something I would take off for. I just want to see that you can identify that, uh, oh, yeah, I made a guess, and uh, it wasn't in agreement with the actual calculation. Right? So uh, the answer to this would be uh, no. Uh, the guess had negative slope. Uh, but the but the but the final answer had positive slope, and I'm not interested in you having a. I'm not interested in you guessing correctly, you know, with no with no information in advance. What I'm interested in, you being able to say that, uh, well, I made a guess just so I have something to look at, and now that I have the actual final answer, I'm able to confirm or deny whether or not my guess was appropriate. So why does it matter? Huh? So why is, uh, on the picture, it's like a negative slope? Yeah. On our final answer, it's a positive one, not match. Why? 
Oh, why? Yeah. Ah, well, in the end, it's just that uh, the actual point three is actually over here, right? So, in fact, it would kind of be like, you know, way up there, you know, where the slope is 104. That's pretty steep, you know? So then all, all that that means is that, you know, I drew the parabola and didn't really know where three was. I just, just, <laughs> just threw a three up there and, uh, you know, three is actually over here. You know, it, it, it should really be, you know, like this. Good. Other questions? Okay. So, uh, good. Now, uh, y'all learned a bunch of derivative rules that are, that are more or less like recipes of how, uh, given specific functions, uh, how do you uh, calculate their uh, derivatives, like the, the, the formulas? So we're going to review those uh, a little bit and make sure that we're all familiar with that. Uh, no notably, you know, this week, m m mostly it's going to be review for, 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 for most of you. Uh, there's two good reasons for that. One is that, you know, review is nice. You know, maybe you forgot. Uh, realistically, maybe some of these things you never knew. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, also, uh, you, we're just meeting each other, right? and uh, surely I'm different than your previous instructors. So it's good for you to uh, hear me say something that you already know, so that uh, we can, you know, get to know each other when you already know what we're talking about, rather than <laughs> something that you may be less familiar with. Uh, okay, so these are now derivative rules. So these are things that uh, <clears throat> uh, that uh, you already know. So first, uh, are you familiar with this syntax? With, with this? Uh, with, with this? With this? Yeah. Okay. So what's the derivative with respect to x of c uh, when c is a constant? Zero. Right. Uh, it's zero. So in the end, uh, you know, the reason is, uh, well, that uh, if you were to plot the function whose output is always c, then the plot of such a function would be a horizontal line. Horizontal lines have slope zero. So the slope of a constant function is zero, so the derivative of a constant is zero. Okay, good. Two. Uh, we already used it uh, a little bit. What is uh, the derivative of x to exponent n uh, when n is uh, not zero? Very good. So it's n multiplied by x to exponent n minus 1. So, uh, you know, this one is common enough to have a name. This one's called the power rule. Uh, we used this one on the previous page, or, yeah, previous page. Uh, an example of its use, you know, is uh, this one. The derivative with respect to x of, say, uh, you know, x to 13. What's that? Well, that'd be 13 x to 12, right? Okay, how about uh, what's the derivative with respect to x of, uh, say, uh, x to uh, negative 5. Okay, good. Negative 5 multiplied by x to negative 6. The whole point is just to remind you that, uh, you know, e even if you're not real comfortable with negative numbers, they still exist, right? And uh, this rule persists. Uh, how about um, what is the derivative with respect to x? 
of say x to 7.2. Right. Right. Seven point two multiplied by x to six point two. Which is to say that uh, well, decimals and fractions it's still it's still going. Uh, how about uh, how about this one? The derivative with respect to x of the square root of x. <clears throat> All right. To, you know, because, uh, you know, for, for some of you, you may be thinking, wait a second, <laughs> I don't see how this one comes next. <laughs> well, as you said, uh, square root corresponds to fractional exponent one half, right? So then uh, you could say, oh, well, this is the same thing as <clears throat> the derivative of x to exponent half. And then now, okay, now you just use the same rule. Okay, <clears throat> that means that uh, the one half would come to the front as a multiplier, multiplied by x, <clears throat> pardon me, to what exponent? Negative one half, right? Because one half minus one is negative one half. So this would be uh, negative one half. Now, I'll remind you that uh, if you have something like uh, y to negative eight, uh, then it's possible to express that y uh, using a positive exponent, but in exchange for what? Yeah, for moving it to a denominator, which is to say that uh, you can, you can uh, express that 8 uh, as positive, so like y to 8, but uh, in exchange for putting it in the denominator. So I'm going to continue doing that with this one and say that, uh, well, that could be rewritten as half multiplied by 1 over x to half, like so. But then, don't we have a cute way to write x to half? Square root, right? Uh, then, now, this is the product of two fractions, so we can combine them into a single fraction. Uh, and get the following. So 1 over 2 square root x. So uh, now, I don't know what uh, your previous calculus instructor might have uh, said. My experience is kind of like 50-50. Uh, I recommend, this is strictly speaking usually not one of the rules that they say you need to memorize this one but uh, I'm going to go ahead and just say it. The derivative of the square root is common enough occurrence that this is just something you should just commit to memory. Uh, rather than, uh, you know, rather than going through that. Uh, this is especially the case when uh, other things are involved, like uh, the product rule or the chain rule and things like that. Uh, good. Any question about the power rule? Okay, uh, three. Um, uh, other individual functions that we know. So what's the derivative of the exponential? E to the x, right? So the exponential function is uh, notable because uh, it's uh, the only function that, that is its own derivative, right? Uh, I have to, you know, sort of like, uh, what do I have to say? Like, uh, put a little asterisk on that, because it's strictly speaking not true. Re really, what I mean is that uh, it's the only, uh, well, the only functions that are their own derivatives are constants multiplied by the exponential. So like 1326 multiplied by e to x is its own derivative. Any constant multiplied. Is. So uh, now, exponentials, any, any uh, discussion of exponentials is immediately followed by the counterpart of the exponential function. Uh, what's the counterpart? The logarithm, right? Uh, so <clears throat> the derivative of the log, 
So did your previous instructor, how did they pronounce that one out loud? Natural log. Natural log. Okay, then I'll say that. Uh, what's the derivative of natural log? 1 over, one over x. 1 over x. Good. Uh, the reason why I have to ask is because, uh, uh, well, depending on, d depending on where the mathematician was trained, this is pronounced differently. <laughs> so like uh, for me, in my head and in my heart, it will always be log. Uh, but uh, we'll call it natural log here. <clears throat> uh, so exponential, this one, y'all don't do sine and cosine. Uh, Okay, yeah, this is, this is, this is uh, all the specific rules, and so now we need to get to the general rules. Okay, so all these are okay? So now the general rules. So here's the thing, is that... Uh, If you have a function, here's another way to get a new function. Now let's back up just a little bit. Suppose you have two numbers. Uh, then you can, you can combine them together to get a new number with uh, addition. Right? Take two numbers, you combine them with an add, and you get another number. But uh, you could also combine them with a multiply. That's another way to get another number. Or you could combine them with a division so long as that the denominator is not zero. Right? Human beings love a system where uh, you can take two things of the same category, combine them, and get, a, get yet another thing of the same category. Right? Add two numbers, you get a number. Right? You combine two cats, more cats. Right? It would be really strange if you got uh, anything else than a cat in that, <laughs> in that case. right? Uh, same thing with functions. Uh, we want to be able to take functions and combine them to get more functions. Uh, then the question is, is that, uh, well, if we have two functions and we know what we know facts about their derivative individually, then uh, what do we know about the derivative after the combination? Okay, so here's the first one. Uh, is that, well, suppose that uh, we know the derivative of f and we have another function that is just c multiplied by f so, and c is a constant. Then what's the derivative? Zero. Not zero. Not quite. Something's missing. So what it'll be is it'll be c multiplied by the derivative of f of x, which is to say that uh, if you had f, and you knew how to compute the derivative of f, and then you multiplied f by 5, say, then the derivative would be 5 multiplied by the derivative of f. That's all that it's, that's all that it's saying. So we did this on the previous page, really. Uh, but uh, it was so simple that uh, you uh, did it without thinking. So here's, here's uh, an example. The derivative of, uh, how about, 13 multiplied by x. Uh, I, it was squared on the previous page, but to, to make the pattern apparent, I'll make that a 3. So now, what I want you to see is that 13 is a constant. As a result, uh, 13 can be factored out of the derivative. Like this, you can say, well, that'll be 13 multiplied by the derivative of x cubed. Which is good, because on the previous page, I can see that that matches a rule on the previous page. It matches the power rule. Uh, what's the derivative of x cubed? 3x squared. As a result, this is 13 multiplied by 3 multiplied by x squared. That's using the power rule from the previous page. Now we can drop the parentheses because multiplication is associative. That's the thingy that says that you can uh, muck around with the with the parentheses. Uh, then once you drop these parentheses, you can add some new parentheses around the 13 and the 3 and multiply them together and get 39. So 
So what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, more or less on the previous page, you did like uh, that. But there were actually two intermediate steps that were involved. Uh, the first was the factoring out of a constant. The second was the invocation of the power rule. The third was uh, some association, you know, messing around with the parentheses. Uh, good. Any question about this? So uh, the name for this rule, this is just for those of you who like to know this, you know, the secret language that mathematicians use when we're back, you know, planning our takeover of the world. We don't really do that. We just drink a lot of coffee. Uh, this, is, uh, this is called homogeneity. To use it in a sentence, you know, we might be back drinking our coffee and say something like, isn't it great that the derivative is homogeneous? And then, you know, cheers to that, you know. <laughs> if you can imagine us in a, doing that. Okay, great. Homogeneity. Second, uh, the derivative. What if you have two functions, f and g, and you know they're you know their derivatives. You know the derivative of f, and you also know the derivative of g. But suppose that I give you those two functions, and before you calculate their derivatives, uh, you add them together, and that gives you another function. Then the question is, is this new function, which is the addition of those two, what's the derivative? Uh-huh. Yeah. It's as simple as can be. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get any easier than that, I think. Uh, again, just for those of you who like to know the names of things, uh, this is called additivity. An example of this, again, was, uh, these are all things that you know, and we literally did this on the previous page. Uh, so, you know, I could say something like, uh, well, how about uh, 13 uh, x cubed, and then plus, uh, I don't know, uh, the log of x. Well, the, uh, that rule above is saying that we can just break that into two different derivatives. You know, do it term by term. So that this is the derivative of 13x cubed plus the derivative of the natural log of x. And then, you know, we know that one. You know, you can, you can do the two intermediate steps in your head, I think, which is to say that, uh, you know, factor the 13 out, invoke the power rule, do some associations, blah, blah. This one is uh, 39 x cubed, uh, squared, I mean, and then uh, that one's 1 over x. Great. Any question about this one? Okay, uh, I won't even bother writing down the subtraction thing because I think you get it, right? Uh, so we can uh, multiply a function by a constant and get another function. Uh, we can add two functions together and get another function. Subtract them, I'm not gonna bother, but, but you get it. Uh, another thing we could do is we could uh, take two functions and divide them. So then, what's the derivative of f of x divided by g of x? And how does it relate to the derivative of f itself and the derivative of g itself? So now, uh, once you've performed a division, the result uh, is called a quotient. 
and as a result, this is called the quotient rule. Uh, good, so this is just more or less something that, uh, well, it's expected that you've already committed it to memory, but if not, let's commit it to memory now. Uh, it will be the derivative. Uh, well, I'll write it with primes, you know, just to sort of mix up the notation instead of ddx. <clears throat> So it'll be f prime evaluated at x multiplied by g of x uh, subtract f evaluated at x multiplied by g prime evaluated at x and then all of that divided by g evaluated at x squared. So that's a, a formula, more or less that uh, you're just expected to memorize. Uh, an example of, of its use uh, could be something like this. Uh, please compute the derivative of, say, um, something mildly interesting. I'm having difficulty here. Uh, how about Five, uh, five log natural log of x. Divided by uh, three x squared plus eight. Okay, so then uh, there's some function in the numerator, there's some function in the denominator, and uh, we want to compute the derivative of the quotient. Okay, so just uh, in the first in the first case, uh, in, well, in the first place, I'm going to use that formula, but I'm not going to actually calculate any. I'm not going to use any derivative rules besides that formula. What I want you to kind of think of this as is that there are uh, you know five slots: one, two, three, four five slots, and I'm just going to just fill in the slots. So what I mean is that, uh, you know, this will be in the top left slot, the derivative of five log x, and then multiplied by three times x squared plus eight. So those are the two slots in the top left, uh, then minus. five times log x times the derivative of three times x squared plus h, and then all of that divided by three times x squared plus h squared. So now, what I want to point out uh, is that I use the quotient rule but uh, I didn't attempt to do multiple things at a time, right? So for example, here I just wrote the derivative of five log x. I didn't attempt to compute the derivative of five log x. I just wrote that there so that I could see, oh, that's, the next, that's one of the next things I have to do. What I'm trying to get you into the habit of, if you're not already, is only try to do one thing at a time. Now there's two good reasons for that. One reason is that, uh, uh, However you esteem yourself, uh, you're a human being, and I find that it is the case that you're not any good at trying to do two things at once. <laughs> I say that about you, not you specifically, and not to be mean or hurtful, only as a statistical truth about the population that I've sampled. <laughs> Second is that, uh, and this is just as important, and that is that uh, in the end, you're going to submit answers to a grader, and uh, you know, in the end, you're trying to have a conversation with them through paper, and you're trying to convince them that uh, you really did know what you were doing. Uh, and if you try and do two steps at once, even if you're kind of doing it right, it can look so weird and confusing that uh, the grader might say, forget it, <laughs> right? You didn't do it right. Uh, because, well, graders are people too, right? Uh, you know, you wouldn't want it to be the case. 
that you wrote some sloppy answer and tried to do more than one step at a time and it was unclear and this grader's been grading for four hours and hasn't had any coffee in three. You see what I mean? So, show your work. Good. Uh, 5 log x. What's the derivative of 5 log x? 5 over x. Okay, good. So I'll write it like this. 5 times 1 over x. Uh, that one just needs to be copied. So now, uh, the, the standing order, the standing request in class is that uh, I will tell you specifically uh, how I want, anything, I want something simplified, if at all. Um, which is to say, you know, to interpret that slightly differently, uh, if I don't explicitly say how I want something simplified, then uh, no simplification is requested. <laughs> Please don't. Uh, that being said, uh, calculus is very often, especially in this class, used as a, as a means to an end, which is to say that uh, most of the time that you find yourself calculating a derivative, that's usually immediately followed by some, you know, because you're trying to do something with it. So, you know, at that point, it's a good idea to simplify, even if I don't say, <laughs> you see what I mean? But uh, at any rate, the reason why I'm saying all this now is that I'm just not going to simplify this. Uh, specifically, yes? Yeah. Are you okay with just accepting three x squared? Yeah, you don't have to write the dot. Okay. So I, I write the dot, uh, so. Uh, that dot right there, right? That's the one where. Yes. So, uh, yes, when you write a three next to an x squared. Uh, right, so here, here's the reason uh, I do that. Uh, I didn't do it like when I was a, well, I didn't do it as an undergraduate, I didn't do it as a graduate, I didn't even do it for the first several years of teaching. Uh, but um, I find that uh, it makes the exposition more clear when I do write it, because many students don't uh, fully appreciate that uh, that dot represents an operation just like the plus does and the subtract does. It's a thing, right? And if you just imagine like textually, like cut, like a, you know, like your word processor, search and replace. Search and replace all the dots with pluses. What would that mean? What does that do? Uh, I write it so that uh, you see that there's something there. But, uh, you know, if you think you want to not do it, go ahead. But I'll, but I'll uh, you know, I won't, uh, it's not required. But uh, I will say that uh, I literally changed the way I do things because I found it to be so useful for students. Whether or not that's meaningful to you is only you can decide. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we've got uh, the quotient rule. Uh, we've got the product rule, so we'll do that quick. Uh, so I'm just going to write it down because, uh, you know, I think uh, you probably, well, you took calculus one. So I write the dot there so that you can, you know, kind of see the similarity between, uh, you know, these two rules. Right? The only, uh, you know, in a sense, it's like a search and replace. If this was a character, it is a character on the keyboard. You know, <laughs> this is a character on the keyboard. And then, you know, if that one also was a character on the keyboard, you could just let uh, so, you know, is, is the rule going to be just like this one, right? Nah, it's a little more interesting than that, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be like this one, where you just, in a sense, distribute the derivative across the sum. It doesn't work that way. Uh, rather, when it's a product, it works like this. So you compute the derivative of the first thing and then multiply it by the second, and then add to that the first thing, multiplied by the derivative of the second. 
you know, and uh, if you like the prime notation thingy, then, you know, it's got, it's got some good things going for it. It's kind of simpler on the eyes anyway. The product rule. Any questions about it? So now, uh, we've talked about how to combine two functions to get a new function. And so far, so far, all the things that we've said, you could have done those things with numbers. So what I mean to say is that uh, given two functions, you can add them together to get a new function. But you can do that with numbers. Given two functions, you can multiply them or divide them, as long as the denominator is not zero, to get a new function. But you could have done that with numbers. So in a sense, so far, we haven't like ventured very, we haven't ventured very far. Uh, there's something you can do with functions, which in a real strong sense is uh, the reason why we uh, mess with them at all. So, and we haven't talked about it yet. It's a way to combine functions to get a new function that's not add, subtract, multiply, divide, or exponent, or any of that. Uh, it's something completely new. So since, you know, this is applied calculus to math 1326, the primary consumer in the school of this course is the business school. Okay, so uh, let's have a business example. So uh, at the, you know, early 1900s roundabout, uh, there's a very important historical figure named Henry Ford, right? And, uh, you know, uh, super wealthy eventually, right? Because he was the owner of Ford Motor Company. Uh, so he's no, you know, Ford Motor Company is notable for uh, lots of things. One of them being that uh, they're the first to mass produce a more or less affordable car. Uh, but uh, that's, that's really, in a business sense, a side item, a minor thing in comparison to the major thing that they introduced. What's the major thing that they introduced? Assembly the assembly line, right? That's, that's the major thing that uh, Ford Motor Company uh, contributed to history. So uh, here's the thing. Uh, the thing that functions can do that, uh, that numbers can't, the new thing that we haven't said out loud so far in this class, is the assembly line, except you didn't call it that. The thing you called it was a, a word that starts with C. Does anyone know it? Yeah? Composition, right? So, uh, here we go. Now, given two functions, so given functions f and g, uh, you know, you could make a new function, we talked about it, but uh, by adding them together, f plus g. That's a new function. Great. You can do f minus g. You can do f uh, divided by g, like so. You can do f multiplied by g. But all, the, all these four things that we've written down, uh, those are all things you could do with numbers. The new thing is you can compose them. Uh, and the symbol for a composition is an open circle, f composed with g. Uh, so this is the one we're talking about now. Uh, and uh, the definition of f composed with g evaluated at x is uh, f of g of x, like so. By way of comparison, uh, say, the definition of f product g evaluated at x is f of x product g of x. Okay, so now, I said something about uh, Ford Motor Company. So here's the thing. Suppose that uh, a function is like a machine that has inputs and produces outputs. And let's call this machine the G machine. So you provide it input x and then out comes g of x. 
you know, you can kind of think of it like a, like a machine. Really, I hope you can imagine, like a step in an assembly line. So now here's the thing. This is the input to the G machine, and that's its output. Ford's major innovation was to realize that, oh, and that output of that machine can be the input to the next one. So now, that's the output of the G machine. Suppose we make that as input to the F machine. What comes out when you do that? Well, because the input to the G machine was X, we name its output G of X. Uh, and if I'm covering up a 3, then the output would be F of 3. If I was covering up an 8, the output would be F of 8. If I was covering up a banana, F of banana. Right. It's a g of x. So what's its output? f of g of x. An assembly line. There's nothing special about two machines in a row, because if you can put two of them in a row, you can put 22 of them in a row. Now, if we make an enclosure, you know, maybe because it's loud or something, I don't know, make a little enclosure. The name for this enclosure in red is F composed with G. So now if I cover that up and you can't see what's happening, we just call that, that's the F composed with G machine. OK. So F composed with G uh, is when the input visits the G machine first, and then afterward the F machine. But uh, because these machines can be, uh, you know, they can be visited in orders, uh, this one is F composed with G. What if we put them in the other order? Is it still F composed with G? No. What will it be? It'll be G composed with F. And those are different. Uh, the difference is that uh, the input visits the F machine first. Now, remember, the, the idea is that we're in calculus, right? And uh, pretty soon we're going to start remembering that uh, we know something about the derivative of F and we know something about the derivative of G. So the thing that we're going to try and figure out is that, uh, well, if we know about the derivative of f, and we know about the derivative of g, and we know the order in which these two functions are composed, then what's the derivative of the whole thing together? That's what we need to address in a minute. Uh, but for now, what I want you to see is that uh, these are two different things. So now imagine that uh, we have an assembly line, and that uh, we're making, you know, not everyone knows about uh, cars. So let's, let's imagine that uh, we're, we make dolls. Okay. So then uh, imagine that we have a left sock putter on her. And uh, we also have a right sock putter on her. You know? uh, and eventually at the end of the thing we've got the packager that puts the doll into the package. Now I have a question for you. Uh, does it, does it matter what order the left sock putter on her and the right sock putter on her are in? Like, would you be able to look at the finished product and say, oh, I can see that the left sock was put on before the right sock? Nah, you wouldn't be able to tell. Okay, so, so it doesn't matter what order those two machines are in. But uh, suppose that you've got a left sock putter on her and a left shoe putter on her. Does it matter what order those are in? Yeah, right? <laughs> one of them is the right way, and the other one's not the right way. <laughs> right? You've got to put the socks on first. Or, if you like, uh, maybe we have an underwear putter on our machine and a pants machine. One of them is, uh, you know, maybe a Ken doll, Barbie's counterpart. And maybe the other one is uh, Clark Kent, Superman. Right? It matters what order. So these are significantly different, potentially. Uh, now, to fully sort of comprehend before I write down the chain rule, uh, to understand why it, why it should be the way it is and not some other way, uh, I want to remind you that, uh, well, 
uh, you know, everybody more or less at university has to take some variety of calculus. And here you all find yourselves in 1326. But uh, there's, a, there's other courses that uh, more or less everyone has to take. One of them is biology. Uh, you know, I had to take biology. <laughs> but, uh, well, I don't use it in my day-to-day -day life, other than I just find it interesting. Uh, but one of, the, one of the important things, just like Ford has, had his day in the sun, and one of the important things about, that happened around the same time in biology was the realization that uh, we don't get sick because of like uh, magic and bad luck and things like that. We get sick because the world is full of creatures who are literally trying to eat us. And uh, we can see them. They're called bacteria and viruses. That's why we get sick. Yeah, it's not the only reason, but uh, it's, the, it's probably the most outstanding reason. Uh, we can see them with a microscope. Right? So then I hope that you've had the experience of being in a biology class and using a microscope. So uh, if you look at a microscope, microscope, then uh, at least the relatively simple ones, the thing that you uh, get your eye real close to right here, and you're looking at it, that's called the eyepiece. And uh, it has a lens in it. And it's able to magnify uh, the image a little bit. Usually, it's about uh, like a times 10 magnification. What that means is that uh, if, you just, if you were to just remove the eyepiece and just look at something uh, through the eyepiece, it'd be 10 times bigger. Uh, good. Now, that's not the only part of a microscope, right? Uh, there's other parts to it. So, you know, it's got some complicated business. Uh, and then it comes down to that rotatey thing. You know what I'm talking about? The part that rotates. It's usually got, like, at least three options. Uh, and you look at them and they say, oh, you know, that's the one that magnifies uh, 20, and that one 40, and that one 100. You know? So <clears throat> let's say th the name of that rotating piece that's right above the specimen you're looking at sitting on the stage, that part's called the objective. So this is the objective. And let's say that uh, at the present time it's set to 40 magnification, which means that uh, if you were to like, just remove that one piece and look through it, it'd be 40. You know, you could, you could see things 40 times there their apparent size. So uh, then, you know, you've got your, you know, goo that you're looking at, uh, and this is the stage, and then there's some very bright light source, you know, that's doing this. It sends photons through the goo. <laughs> the, the, the photons travel through the objective. They're, they're spread out 40 times, and then they travel through the body and the neck of the microscope, and then travel through the objective. So this one has magnification uh, 40, and that one 10. So does that mean that the total magnification is 50? What is it? 400, right? 400, because uh, this one spreads out the photons by a factor of 40. They travel through the body of the microscope, and then they're spread out by a further factor of 10. So with a relatively cheap and simple microscope, you can see something, you can magnify something 400 times. And here's the thing, if you, were to put, uh, if you were to make a brighter light source and have a higher quality lens and then put even a third uh, lens in between them, you know, the like magnification 20 or something, then that wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be magnification 420, it'd be magnification 8,000. Because it multiplies, right? It multiplies. So the total magnification is the product. So here's the thing. Uh, the name of the rule for how uh, the derivative works with sums is called the sum rule. The name of the way that the derivative works with uh, quotients is the quotient rule. The name for the way the derivative works with products is the product rule. So the name for the way the derivative works with compositions is the chain rule. <laughs> right? Obviously. <laughs> the chain rule. The chain rule says that if you compute the derivative of a composition, 
So notice that uh, in this order, that means that uh, the, the initial input X visits the G machine first. It sees G, and then the output of the G machine goes to the F machine. The derivative will be the derivative of F evaluated at the input it sees. It sees that input, right? Because uh, what, what uh, you know, what we're looking at is F composed with G evaluated at X, which is F of G of X, which looking at in the sort of assembly line uh, view, it sees G first, produces output, intermediate output G of X, and then the, in, oops, the input to the F machine is G of X. So what we're saying is that uh, in order to get the derivative of the whole machine, you, com you compute the derivative of the last part and evaluate it at its input. But we couldn't stop here, right? That wouldn't make any sense. Because, uh, you know, what about G's derivative? Surely that has something to do with it. So you also need to evaluate G's derivative, and you need to evaluate G at its input. What is G's input? X, right? And because these things occur one after another, how are we con going to combine these two? Are they going to be combined with addition? No, they're going to be combined with multiplication. In the exact way, and for more or less exactly the same reasons, uh, that sequential lenses, the total magnification is a product, not a sum. The chain rule. Beautiful. So we have time for one example. So how about, uh, say, the derivative of the square root of uh, 13 times x to 7 plus 5x plus 8. So what I want you to see is that uh, the input is x. Now the first function that's visited is that polynomial the 13, x to 7, blah, 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 blah. So that polynomial is made first. And then that polynomial is provided as input to the next function, which is the square root. So there's two things that occur. First, the polynomial. And you can compute the derivative of any, of any polynomial. Uh, then the square root. So two things in a row. Uh, as a result, we'll need to use the chain rule. What I want you to see is that uh, the pattern for this problem looks like this. It looks like you're computing the derivative of the square root of, and uh, I'm going to write something in there. And if I wrote x, well, then that would be something that we wrote uh, five pages ago. But it's not an x. But to sort of make it look more simple to our eyes, I'm going to write u. Now, if it, uh, now, if it was exactly x for the moment. Imagine that u was an x. Then uh, I told you it would be a good idea to memorize that uh, the derivative is 1 over 2 multiplied by the square root of, well, if it was an x, then we'd want to write it. it. But it's not. It's a u. So now, that means that uh, what I've written so far couldn't possibly be complete. There must be more to do. Uh, what, what more there is to do is that, uh, you know, you might not be x. You might wiggle around as x wiggles around. It might, it might depend on x. As a result, uh, we need to multiply by something. And this is, you could think of it like the correct, correction factor that the uh, chain rule specifies. We have to multiply by the derivative with respect to x of u. Okay, so let's do this quick. 
Now, if that was exactly an x, if that u was an x, then what's the derivative with respect to x of x? Just a 1, right? And that would just be a fancy way to write 1. And that would be right. OK, so here we go. We'll be done in 20 seconds. Uh, whoops, I didn't mean to write that. So this will be 1 over 2 multiplied by the square root of that polynomial, 13x to 7 plus 5x plus 8. Now, if that polynomial had been exactly x, then we'd be finished. There wouldn't be anything more to do. That would mean that uh, there wasn't a machine that came before the square root, essentially. But there was. So that means that uh, we have to multiply by the derivative of that polynomial. Because that's what represents the fact that uh, before we got to the square root, we first uh, had to pass through that polynomial. And now the last thing we need to do is just to evaluate that. The 1 over 2 multiplied by the square root. 13x to 7. This first part is just getting copied. Uh, then multiplied by, well, 91 times x to 6 plus 5. This is just like the uh, magnifications in a, in a microscope multiply. The first, the, the objective? No, which one would be which? Nah, to, I'm too scrambled to see which one's which. Okay, so that's all for today. I hope you have a wonderful Tuesday.